My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. For this week's podcast, I'm going to be doing something I've never done before. I'm actually just going to play for y'all a presentation that I did as a, a video for an academic conference. The presentation is on a museum on Taiwanese comfort women. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself that I don't know if I really discussed on the podcast that much. So I did my dissertation on museums in China and Taiwan and the politics of those museums constructed constructed around nationhood within their museum narratives. In 2019, I actually got a notification that there was a group in Vienna, that's Vienna, Austria, that was working on questions of memory of World War II in museums. They needed someone who did research on museums in China, specifically museums in China related to World War II. And they were actually going to pay the successful candidate to come to Vienna, live uh, a life in, in Vienna. And I was like, live in Vienna for a bit? That would be a ton of fun. So I applied. I didn't get it. I got the notification in February 2020, just before the world began to end. The person who did get it, in fact, was much better for the position. She's a Czech scholar who works specifically on World War II museums in China, whereas my, re my research on museums was not specifically about World War II. I did touch on the topic in my research, but I was interested in Ta uh, China and Taiwan in periods that had nothing to do with World War II. So I didn't get it, but this research group was super cool about it. They offered me a position as an affiliate researcher, which basically meant they weren't going to give me any money, but they would let me continue to work with them in academia. That's actually a, a pretty cool deal. So I was like, mm, yeah, of course, I'm going to do this. The experience of working with these folks in, in Vienna has been great. They've all been great colleagues. Uh, one of the things I've gotten a chance to do is to present with them on the issue of Taiwanese comfort women in the museum space. Just a refresher, comfort women during World War II, the Japanese Empire forced women, usually women from colonies outside of Japan, like Korea, Taiwan, China into sex slavery for the sake of the Japanese army. Women were forced to have sex with hundreds of men in a day. It was very, very trying existence. The issue of the comfort women has been quite controversial in Asia, with many in the Koreas and Chinas feeling quite angry about the topic, while many in Japan, particularly those on the Japanese right, deny that this even happened, or they suggest that these women somehow consented to work as prostitutes for the Japanese army. Here's my perspective on this issue. All of the evidence suggests that most of these women, though not all, but most of these women were trafficked against their will into sex slavery. This did happen, full stop. This did happen. The evidence for this is overwhelming. There is a lot of scholarship on this topic in China, in Korea, in Japan. What's interesting is that there's not actually that much scholarship on it in Taiwan. In fact, as I mentioned in the talk that y'all are going to hear, it was not until the 1990s that it became clear that the Japanese government had actually trafficked in Taiwanese women. For those of y'all who don't know, Taiwan was Japan's longest serving colony, unless you count Okinawa. But since Okinawa is still a part of the Japanese state, I'm not going to count that. Though I know some of my friends in Naha would suggest that I'm wrong there. Taiwan was Japan's oldest colony, and Taiwan has a special relationship with Japan, unlike Korea where there's widespread hatred of Japan. The Taiwanese really mostly like Japan. I was having dinner with a Korean friend of mine, and he confirmed, yeah, you know, Koreans look at Taiwan, and they don't understand how the Taiwanese could have been colonized by the Japanese, and yet still actually like Japan. Well, <clears throat> the reason is the situation of the countries at the time of Japanese colonization is totally different. This is why they have this differing reaction to Japanese colonialism. Taiwan. Unlike Korea, Taiwan was a Qing dynasty colony that really kind of existed on the edge of the Qing dynasty. Of course, Korea was in a sort of colonial relationship with the Qing and other Chinese dynasties, but it was functionally its own country. Taiwan was colonized by the Qing in, starting in 1683. They had this existence where they were kind of the frontier of China. And then in the 1800s, they kind of became a normal part of China. But no one ever recognized Taiwan as, as a kind of having this very different situation. Then 1895, Japan takes Taiwan over. They make it into a Japanese colony. 
And as a colony, Taiwan was actually better treated under the Japanese than under the Chinese. In some ways, Japan made Taiwan Taiwanese. For Korea, the Japanese repressed Korean identity. But for Taiwan, there had never been anything like a Taiwanese identity before Japan. Under Japan, there emerged the sense of a Taiwanese identity. So a lot of folks, not all of them, but a lot of folks in Taiwan are really grateful for that. Which brings me to the comfort women issue. Taiwanese women were definitely trafficked by the Japanese empire. We know that because in the early 1990s, someone in the Japanese parliament discovered some Japanese military telegrams asking Taiwanese comfort women to be sent to particular military locations. So we know that it happened. But after that telegraph was discovered, something really interesting happened. Something I talk about in my talk you're going to hear in a few minutes. Some folks in Taiwan, particularly those closely linked to the KMT, the party that wants to unify Taiwan with China, they played up the importance of this issue. The comfort women issue was used by these folks in the KMT as a political cudgel to bash the Japanese with. While other folks in Taiwan, particularly those associated with the DPP, the party that is closely linked with the Taiwanese independence movement, some of those folks denied that anything happened, despite all the evidence. They denied that Taiwan had had women trafficked by the Japanese empire. Wen Shilong is uh, the most prominent example of this kind of, of denier. He was linked to the DPP movement. He actually just died in November. He was a close advisor to Chen Shui-bian, the first DPP, the first DPP president of Taiwan. He did an interview in 2001 with the most famous of right-wing manga artists that Japan has. Yes, there are many right-wing manga artists in Japan. This one's name is uh, Kobayashi Yoshinori. And Wen Shilong said, you know what? Hey, these women, they weren't really trafficked. This caused a firestorm in Taiwan. Wen Shilong was forced to resign from his position as an advisor to the Taiwanese president. Even today, there is this view on Taiwan, even amongst Taiwan's left, that this issue is not really one we really want to deal with right now. I was talking with someone a few weeks ago. I mentioned to him the, the presentation that I was doing on Taiwanese comfort women. And he actually told me a story. He says he works with people in a party that's different from the DPP. The party is the New Power Party. It's a pro-Taiwanese independence party, but it's not part of the DPP. It has a similar agenda, but it's a different party. This guy was talking to these activists in the New Power Party. These are young, progressive political thinkers, the kinds of folks you would expect to be like, yes, let's believe these women who say they were raped as a part of the Japanese military program. No questions asked. But they didn't say that. What they did say is this. Yes, we all agree that this happened. This was definitely a thing. But it's not convenient right now to talk about the Taiwanese comfort women issue. We need to keep this on the down low. Why? Well, if China attacks Taiwan, we need to rely on Japan and the U.S. to come to our rescue. So if we are constantly talking about how Japan trafficked in these women, then they're going to be less inclined to come to Taiwan's rescue in case of an emergency. So all of that gives you all an introduction to this historical issue, some of which I go over in the presentation. The presentation itself is actually more focused on the museum, which... You know, this is a Chinese literature podcast. You can kind of count that as a work of literature. I know some people wouldn't think of a museum as a work of literature, but in my research, actually, I, I argue that, that museums function as any work of literature would, something you have to read. I don't want to get into the theory behind that, but I don't really see museums as different from you know, books that you pick up. The following is a presentation that I was supposed to give in Vienna. They had a big EU-supported convention there in Vienna. I was supposed to go to present there in person, but I was not able to make it due to childcare issues. So I ended up making this video. It was played there in Vienna for me. The audio that you're going to hear is from that presentation, but I should point out that originally this was a video presentation, and as I have some images in the presentation, I'm going to actually upload the original video to the Chinese Literature Podcast YouTube page and to the Chinese Literature Podcast page itself. So if you want to stop this right now and just go and look at that and watch it as a YouTube video, you, you certainly can. If you want to find it, you can just go 
to our YouTube page, which just go to YouTube's homepage and then search for a Chinese literature podcast. If you want to see it on the podcast website, go to ChineseLiteraturePodcast.com. While you're there, why not pre-order my upcoming book, China's Backstory, the literature and history behind today's front page China news. I'm working very hard on getting that book written now that I'm done with teaching. I'm working super hard. Uh, I've written about 100 pages on Taiwan in the past two weeks. Okay, the presentation that follows is going to be my presentation from that talk. My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. My name is Lee Moore. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Oregon in the United States, teaching Chinese and Taiwanese literature and film. I also work as a journalist, writing occasionally for papers such as The Economist. I'm currently finishing a book geared towards a general audience rather than a scholarly audience. The title of that book is China's Backstory, the Literature and History Behind Today's Front Page China News. And finally, I'm the host of the Chinese Literature Podcast. I apologize for not being able to be in person in Vienna today. I had some child care issues come up. I want to thank Professor Radenick and my other colleagues at the GMM for being so willing to accommodate me and allow me to present via this video. Okay, I want to turn to my project. My project looks at the way that memory of the comfort women, that those that is, those women who were trafficked uh, as a part of the Japanese empire, how that issue has played out both in Taiwanese society more broadly, but also in terms of uh, a particular Taiwanese museum. The site that I selected to, to work on is called the AMA Museum. It's Taiwan's only museum dedicated to remembering these women who were trafficked by the Japanese during World War II. The world, along with my project, has changed quite a bit since uh, I began this journey with my colleagues in Vienna. I interviewed to be one of the researchers as a part of the GMM in February 2020. I was given the honor to become an associate researcher with the GMM just as the world seemed to be ending. The project that I have been working on with the good folks at the GMM uh, has focused on the AMA Museum in Taiwan, and I've ar already presented on this project with my colleagues twice. However, strangely, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I was not able to travel to Taiwan and visit the museum itself until May of 2023. So this presentation is actually the first time that I'm able to do uh, justice to this discussion. The issue of reckoning with the historical legacy of women trafficked by the Japanese imperial state during World War II is complicated throughout Asia, but it's hard to find a place where the issue is more complicated than Taiwan. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to articulate what makes the comfort women issue unique in Taiwan. My argument is this. The comfort women issue had a different political resonance when compared with China or Korea or other parts of Asia. Uh, other than Japan. In fact, the divisions in Taiwanese society over how to remember these trafficked women, and even where, whether or not to remember these trafficked women, it resembles the highly politicized memory of these women in Japan. But the differing memories of these trafficked women is perhaps even more clearly connected to Taiwanese politics. The bi bifurcation of of the memory of these comfort women is closely linked to the two different political groupings that dominate Taiwan. As a brief detour into Taiwanese history, the KMT ruled Taiwan as a single party state until the 1980s when democracy was allowed to blossom. During the dictatorship, any discussion of Taiwan as a distinct entity separate from China was violently suppressed. At this point, two party groupings develop, the Blue Party Bloc and the Green Party Bloc. These two party groupings are differentiated on one single point. What relationship should Taiwan have to China? As Professor Kirk Denton in his recent book on Taiwanese museums, Landscapes of Historical Memory, has noted, since democratization in Taiwan, political parties play an important role in the museums of Taiwan. The Blue Party Bloc is made up of sem several remnants of the old KMT, along with a handful of other parties. The Blue Party members see Taiwan as a part of China. The main goal of politics for those in these Blue Party groupings, uh, defending this idea that Taiwan should be unified with China. Uh, 
as a part of this ideology, the Blue Party bloc tends to despise Japan for its role in fighting the KMT during World War II. Let's turn to the second party bloc. The Green Party bloc is made up of different groups. Um, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, being the, the main party in this group. The Green Party bloc is made up of groups who all agree that Taiwan should be independent of China. The Green Party blocs tend to despise the KMT and China. They regard China and Taiwan as separate entities. When they view the history of Taiwan, they tend to view the Japanese period relatively positively, despite the fact that it was an uh, uh, a colonial period where Taiwan was colonized by Japan, which brings us to a different issue, the issue of comfort women in Taiwan. There was this general belief that Taiwanese women had not been victims of the comfort women system. This belief held for a long time in the post-war period. But in February of 1992, Japanese diet member Ito Hideki discovered three telegrams from the Japanese military requesting the dispatch of Taiwanese comfort women, proving that Taiwan had been a victim of the comfort women system, that Taiwanese women had been victimized by this system. Uh, in 1992, the KMT-led government, which is fighting a rearguard action against democratization, is it's slowly, the KMT is in charge at this point, and it's slowly bringing democracy into Taiwan, KMT State worked with an NGO, the Taipei Women's Rescue Fund, and set up a hotline to identify the women who had been trafficked by the Japanese Empire. The, uh, the KMT-led uh, state also passed legislation uh, providing compensation to women who did not feel like the Japanese legislature's compensation was sufficient. The Taipei Women's Rescue Fund is identified uh, it, it identifies 48 women still living at the time in 19 in the 1990s who were trafficked. They were recruited between 1938 and 1945. Overall estimates range between 1,200 and 2,000 women being trafficked. Just as Taiwan is democratizing, this issue was thrust into Taiwanese politics. What is the result? Many people who identified with the blue political bloc, those who tended to identify with with China and who saw the KMT as the victim of Japanese imperial aggression, they felt strongly that these uh, 2,000 women had been victims of Japanese imperialism. Or to say this in a different way, they projected their own understanding of their Chinese identity, victimized by uh, Japanese imperialism, onto these women. On the other side, as the comfort women issue spreads throughout Taiwanese politics, those who are in the Green Party uh, blocks uh, tended to discount the experience of these comfort women as either false, they said that these women were lying, or they downplayed the importance of this issue in history. So discussions of the comfort women issue in the 1990s was something that was uh, promoted by the KMT-led government, which at the time still ruled Taiwan. The first Green Party, uh, the first uh, uh, pro-green, uh, green-leaning government did not take power until the year 2000. Thus, many in Taiwan society interpreted the comfort women issue as a highly politicized issue. Uh, that should be understood through one's own political identity and through the lens of how one understands Japan's role in Taiwanese history. That is, if a person identifies with the blue camp, one was to feel sorrow for the comfort women and to understand the comfort women as sharing something of their own identity, that of being victims of Japanese colonialism. But if a person identifies with the green camp, if a person tends towards a pro-Taiwanese identity, the expectation came to be that one was to ignore or discount these testimonies raised by the comfort women. As one activist working in the Taipei Women's Rescue Fund stated, quote, the problem is Taiwanese society is not that interested in the past, probably because under the KMT rule, we've been brainwashed too much. Any talk about World War II immediately raises suspicions that it's pan-blue KMT propaganda. So this all occurs in the 1990s as Taiwan is democratizing and as its population was shifting from a China-oriented identity imposed by the KMT under its dictatorship towards an identity that's embraced 
uh, Taiwan and Taiwaneseness as the main identity vector. Indeed, the shift from a China-oriented identity to a Taiwan-oriented identity has been the main thread in Taiwanese politics over the last three decades. This meant that many people in Taiwan simply decided to discount the travails of these comfort women, their testimonies. Those in the Green Party bloc began to deny that anything wrong had happened in Taiwan, most famously the rightist manga author uh, Kobayashi, who published a manga called On Taiwan. He argued that the Japanese government did not traffic in women. In February 2001, interviews that Kobayashi had done with Xu Wenlong, a business magnate and advisor to green-leaning DPP President Chen Shui-bian, uh, this interview is released as a part of the Chinese language edition of Kobayashi's book. Uh, it caused a major controversy. Xu Wenlong was forced to resign as an advisor to Chen Shui-bian, though Xu maintained his stance that uh, these women were not trafficked. This incident is indicative of how the Green Party bloc has treated the issue. I appreciate y'all for sticking with me and wading deep into Taiwanese politics before we turn to the real issue here, the AMA Museum, uh, the only museum in Taiwan dedicated to describing the difficulties these women went through as they were trafficked. The AMA Museum, uh, the official name is the AMA Peace and Women's Human Rights Museum. It was opened in 2016. AMA is the Taiwanese word that means uh, colloquially mother or female servant. It's the word that has come to be used in Taiwan to describe these women. The museum opening ceremony was attended by the controversial KMT president Ma Ying-jeou. Uh, again, this underlines the politicized nature of the museum in Taiwan. Uh, the Taipei Women's Rescue Fund, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that group organized the museum. Um, the Taipei Women's Rescue Fund has been very mindful of the politics of the issue in Taiwan, and when it could, it sought to avoid these politics, though it was never really possible. The museum is supported by some government subsidies, but still there was not sufficient public interest. In 2019 alone, the museum incurred a cost of $4 million new Taiwanese dollars, approximately 134,000 U.S. dollars. They had to close the museum in 2020 and move into a cheaper space. Uh, they reopened in November of 2021. In other words, the museum has, like the larger comfort women issue, not drawn as much public interest as it has in the PRC or in the Koreas. When I visited the museum in May of 2023, I was surprised to find what kind of state this museum was in. The museum is open to the public, but it's so difficult to find that uh, it almost seems like the museum is hiding. Uh, these are uh, some images uh, uh, that I have of, of the museum. You can uh, see how difficult it is to find. When I, a researcher knowing quite a bit about the museum, tried to find the museum, I personally struggled to actually find the site. The museum is located on the fifth floor of a nondescript office building north of central Taipei. Outside the building, there is no sign that the museum even exist inside. If one does not know the exact address, there's no way to find this museum. And I did have the exact address, and I walked past the museum several times in the space of 10 minutes trying to find the museum. It's almost as if the museum is intentionally hidden. The museum is located, like I said, on the fifth floor of this nondescript office building. At the entrance to the building where you have to enter, there is a, a series of nameplates showing different businesses operating on each floor of the building. Therefore, the AMA Museum, it doesn't actually say AMA Museum. What is listed in Chinese is just Taipei Women's Rescue Fund, along with a dash in the word AMA. But there is no sign that this is a museum. The official name, AMA Peace and Women's Rights Museum, does not appear anywhere on the exterior of the building or even when you enter. Nothing indicates that there is a museum upstairs. This is squeezed right in between an office store and a furniture store. So this is just to say, it's almost as if there is an effort to hide this museum. What is surprising is that inside there is the small and ex excellent museum uh, that offers a fully-throated uh, defense of these women and uh, does a great job of trying to portray the suffering that these women 
went through. This museum has several exhibits on women who were trafficked. Uh, the exhibits inside give voice to these women, telling their stories. Sometimes uh, these uh, women's stories are printed out on signage inside the museum, but other times the exhibit quite literally gives voice to these women with audio recordings that museum goers can listen to as the women, uh, through recordings, tell their own story with their own voices. You have these PVC pipes that uh, have recordings of the AMA uh, women's voices coming out of them. The exhibit design is thoughtful and thought-provoking. Much of the signage inside the museum is hung on wire mesh, reminiscent of some sort of prison. And some of the testimonies of these women are actually hidden behind these uh, wires, as if, metaphorically, these women's words are being shown in some sort of imprisoned state. The ex uh, exhibits themselves show, not surprisingly, a very anti-Japanese perspective. They clearly attach blame to the Japanese side, which is, but in a Taiwanese context, that is uh, uh, controversial. Uh, this confirms what those in both the blue and green political camps suggest with their behavior, that even in giving voice to these women, these exhibits are as much focused on faulting Japan. Here's one example of a typical exhibit. The signage here reads, quoting the victim's own words, My wound, I will perhaps forget it on the day that I die. This is not something that I did myself. It was the Japanese people who did it to me. End quote. Uh, down below, there is an extension of the signage that tells the visitors that the, uh, the father of this particular trafficked woman incorrectly thought that she was working as a cleaner and that she kept her trafficking a secret, often waking at night, crying. Her husband thought wrongfully that she was having nightmares. Uh, there was no one who knew her misery. So the museum does a great job uh, giving voice to these women, but it also tends to show uh, or reproduce parts of Taiwanese society that sometimes seem a bit dated. This image is a good example. Uh, this image shows what the AMA did as young women before they were trafficked. You can see the breakdown in occupations uh, that these women have. Uh, you can see women are shown in these occupations uh, in a fairly gendered means of representation. You have three occupations of women. Uh, in the red dress, you have, quote, special occupations, such working uh, women working in bars and hotels and restaurants, tea rooms or coffee shops. In the white dress, you can see this very sexualized rendering of a nurse. And in the black and white dress, you can see women in a French maid's outfit. This uh, represents those women who were working as servants before they were trafficked. All of these women are wearing high heels, and all of them show a fairly sexualized uh, form of the, these feminized occupations. Women working in bars and tea houses shown with a split skirt uh, that goes very high on the thigh. The French maid outfit is even stranger. It's strange because uh, I, I don't believe women in Taiwan in, in 1940s Taiwan ever wore any outfit like that. I've tried to figure out why these women in this image are so sexualized. This museum, the AMA Museum, is named AMA Peace and Women's Human Rights Museum. Uh, it seems strange to sexualize these women after they have been sexualized so much by the Japanese Empire. I was never able to figure out why they chose this form of representation. My best guess is just that this is uh, and this is just well-informed speculation. This museum tends to play up the gendered identity of these women as a part of the women's human rights aspect of this museum, which involves highlighting the their genders in this exhibit. Uh, but it seems like it struck me as a very strange way to do it. All of this is to say, in these exhibitions on how women were sexualized by the Japanese Empire, the exhibits themselves highlight the women's sexuality in a manner that strikes me as inappropriate. Uh, this has been a fairly brief exploration of the AMA Museum. I, I have a very limited amount of time. It's a topic that definitely deserves more. To briefly restate the main points that I, I've wanted to make is the museum is highly politicized. Those in the blue political bloc tend to see women as symbols of China's own interaction with Japanese colonialism. They interpret women as uh, signifiers of how China was mistreated. Those in the green political bloc tend to see this period of Taiwan's history as not a problem, 
and because of this, they ignore the fate of these trafficked women. The museum itself does a great job of exploring the lives and pains of these women, giving voice to these women, um, but the museum, museum itself seems designed to be hidden. Uh, the museum does not uh, advertise itself at all to the point where this seems intentional. Uh, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening to me and uh, being willing to let me present by a video. 